So, okay, what I'm going to talk about is uh, plasma observations and analysis. Um, we performed um, um, over a number of weeks last summer a, uh, uh, a lot of experiments and observations and then most of the analysis we did in the fall and uh, winter. And this is kind of my thing. I've been doing plasma physics and chemistry and atomic and molecular physics and spectroscopy for nearly 50 years, uh, 40, I'm 48 years actually. Um, so this kind of work is my thing and this is only the second public talk I've ever given in almost 50 years. So, uh, I consider myself to be lucky in that respect. Um, so this is, um, I'm not sure why I have so many slides of this. This, this is a, uh, a photo showing one of our anodes, our big anode, I don't know if you can see it, is, is about that big. That's what they look like. Uh, in the pictures you can't tell, I mean it could look, it could be the size of a softball, but uh, the big one is actually that big. Um, and. Uh, we observe a number of uh, features on it. Um, let's see, there's the plasma. Um, you've seen the spots or tufts um, um, in various things, and I'll talk about those later. Um, and around them, uh, uh, it, it's a positive ion current coming out, and electric fields and magnetic fields uh, are formed around them. Um, and then, uh, you've seen um, in some of the movies the striations. Um, so that's the first thing I'll talk about. The, um, the device is actually a, uh, uh, as close to a spherical plasma as we can make. Um, the anode is uh, the high voltage um, um, the, the positive, it, it's, it's the positive electrode at, at, at high voltage and everything around it, um, any metal is a ground. And uh, let's see, what do we have here? Um, so the electric field from the, um, the anode points out. Um, and so if, if you look at the flow of particles, the electrons, which are negative, would flow toward the anode and the positive ions would flow outward. So, um, so basically it looks like that. You have an electron current flowing toward the anode on average, not always, but on average, and an ion current flowing outward. Now, to give you some idea of how this thing works, I was gonna do this as a demo, but you probably couldn't see it anyway. Here's a, one of our small anodes. This thing's only, uh, oh, about six millimeters in, in diameter. Um, and what I did here is I put a, uh, in, at atmospheric pressure, a 50 kilovolt um, Tesla coil attached to it. And you see, I mean, there, there's, no, there's no cathode at all, actually. Um, uh, the, the world around the anode is the cathode. And, but you see a, a, a similar kind of thing. You see this plasma expanding outward from, uh, uh, from that little anode and you see a bunch of streamers. Now, um, one of the things uh, between this and atmospheric pressure and what we do, which is uh, about a thousandth of atmospheric pressure, is we don't see streamers like that. That's, that, that's an artifact of high gas pressure. Um, and what you'll see when I bring up this video is what we call a, uh, a diffuse arc. Now, Let's see, how do I start the video? Uh, there it is. Okay, if you look going out to the left, um, at atmospheric pressure, that would be a spark. Uh, at a tor pressure, it's, uh, um, it's a, a diffuse arc. And um, interestingly, just recently, um, uh, people think that they have observed uh, lightning on Mars, uh, and at a low pressure, our pressure is about the same as that of Mars. So what you would see in, uh, um, uh, in a Martian discharge would be the kind of thing that we see here, it would be a, a diffuse arc. Now, the, 
Um, you saw that the previous video ended with this striated discharge. It, um, um, striations have been observed for almost 200 years in gas discharges. And uh, you've seen them before too. Uh, you see them in fluorescent tubes that are failing. Um, the fluorescent tube is, is mostly argon with a little bit of mercury in it. But when you, uh, uh, some air leaks into it, then you get an instability uh, that forms moving striations. And uh, you've probably all seen those. In this particular case, we have an interesting phenomenon. It, it goes from the arc mode into all of those striations. Um, and then over a period of about um, one and a half seconds uh, um, per, per mode, it changes modes. And you, you just, I, I don't know how to repeat the video, but you, 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 just, you just saw it do that. And that's happening. Oh, there it is, okay. Um, as the, um, we were slowly decreasing the pressure uh, so what that corresponds to in, in physics jargon is uh, an increased uh, mean streak path uh, that the electrons uh, take before uh, they collide with something. So, um, uh, so those striations tend to spread out, and th that's what happens here. So in this case, you know, there's our uh, 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 striated. These pictures aren't as cool as the ones that Monty showed. I took these myself. Um, you see our, our serrations, our, our multiple layers. And um, if you look at what's going on, uh, I did a density scan across the video, which you can see um, on the, the left-hand curve. Um, and uh, um, so you, basically you're looking at intensity as a function of uh, radius out from the, the anode. and each of those uh, uh, dips in intensity corresponds in a, in a nonlinear manner uh, to uh, a potential well, uh, the, the, the local voltage or local electric potential uh, is decreasing, but then it hits a, uh, a minimum and increases, and so each of those uh, striations corresponds to the formation of potential wells. And they have some uh, uh, interesting features. Uh, if you look at this, uh, on the left you can see the, um, the anode and you can see a, a blow up of the striations. On the right, you can see, now this is the actual electric field, which is the derivative of the, of the poten uh, voltage or electric potential. Um, you can see places where uh, the electric field is a maximum, and that corresponds to maximum light emission. Uh, that's where it's brightest. Uh, and in terms of plasma chemistry, that corresponds to um, where you have the greatest ionization. So you have a higher plasma density or electron density, charge density, whatever you want to call it. And the dominant ions tend to be uh, ionized molecular hydrogen and uh, 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 triatomic molecular hydrogen, hydrogen H3+, plus. and also you have the greatest dissociation of hydrogen into hydrogen atoms. So that's what happens at the, um, at the extremes of the electric field. Um, it, uh, uh, as you go through the potential, uh, then the electric field reverses direction. That's why I said on average the electrons flow uh, uh, toward the anode and the positive ions flow out. Uh, inside of these potential minima, uh, it's not that way. Uh, uh, there's, uh, the electric field changes direction, and at the places where I've circled in green, it's zero. There's no electric field, uh, which means that's, that's the intensity minimum. Uh, basically, there's no field driving charged particles so that um, um, there's no light emitted. Um, in fact, the, the electrons actually get uh, attached to, uh, to hydrogen, and it's mostly H minus ions. So uh, those are really interesting regions, but that's what corresponds to uh, what's known as a, a double layer. Uh, uh, in order to have an electric field, you have a difference in potential. It means there's a charge differential. And what you see in, um, 
in this kind of thing is the um, uh, places where the charge builds up on one side or the other and the electric field changes directions. And although in that video, the, um, um, the striations, uh, it, it, it switched modes as we changed pressure from, uh, um, uh, from a large number of striations to smaller, 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 and back to a bare uh, anode again with a glow around it. Um, we ha we've had experiments where the striations were stable for minutes. And an, an interesting phenomenon that may occur is if you look back at, at the other uh, uh, um, photos, uh, the uh, discharge isn't actually perfectly spherical. It's, um, it's aspherical uh, to some degree, more or less degree, depending on conditions. But um, because of that, actually what you'll have is a, uh, you'll have currents flowing azimuthally and altitudinally around inside of these shells. And that, that's really a unique phenomenon. No one's ever looked into that. Um, but it, it's something that's apparent when, uh, uh, you know, having done this for half a century, when, when I first saw these kinds of things, there must be something like that going on. Now, um, there's a, uh, an interesting correlation. I, I really know nothing about solar physics, uh, almost nothing at all. But uh, th this is a uh, uh, different version of a slide. This is from uh, Skylab data taken in the 70s of, um, of what Michael showed, um, where we have the red curve is the temperature going out uh, away from the sun, and the blue curve is the density. Um, and it goes through, I don't remember how to do the marker on this thing, but you can, uh, you can see there's a minimum out at you know, what amounts to zero kilometers on, on this scale. Uh, that actually is about 4,500 degrees. And I mean, compared to the, the million degrees uh, on one side, uh, as you go out into, uh, let's go through the layers here, out into the corona, um, and then the much higher, the, the, what eventually end up being the much higher temperatures as you go inward. So I, I've never really read anything about about that, but it seems to me, uh, you know, if there, if there's an electrical nature to the sun, and there must be, you have magnetic fields and it takes electric currents to um, produce magnetic fields, that's the only way it can happen. Um, and um, it takes a, uh, uh, a voltage or charge differential to create electric fields. And um, so, uh, uh, and as we saw in uh, the picture of all the striations, it, uh, um, we have potential minima. So my guess is, you know, if you were looking at um, electrical phenomena in the sun, that, uh, let's catch up here, um, that, uh, that minimum in the temperature might correspond to uh, some kind of double layer of potential well, electric potential well. And it, it, it's an interesting thing uh, because it, um, most of the material in, at 4,500 degrees is, uh, is neutral hydrogen. Uh, it's not ionized. Um, so you have uh, uh, lots of molecules, and I listed some of them at the bottom. Titanium oxide, uh, the diatomic carbon molecule, CH, uh, uh, calcium hydride, et cetera, it goes on. Uh, even, even water, H2O, uh, the spectra can be seen in there. So it's a really unusual region, and I've never read uh, much about it, but it's the kind of thing that we might be able to see in our experiments um, in, the, in the minima of these striations. And it's something that, that uh, if we say we used a tungsten anode, which uh, uh, in principle melts at 3500 C, but in my own experience using tungsten electrodes, you really have to go to 4500 C before it, uh, it, it really melts. It vaporizes about 5500 degrees C. So, um, you know, if we did something like that, we actually might be able to emulate the, uh, what amounts to the potential minimum on the, um, on the solar, in the solar chromosphere. 
So it's, it's a region of interest to me because I like molecules better than I like ions and, uh, or even atoms. I'm very fond of molecules. So uh, the next thing, going back now to, so that, that, that's one thing we can investigate, um, especially when we have Langmuir probes and all that kind of thing. Uh, now, let's see, how does this work? Does this, is this one the video? There it is. Okay, here, I took this one myself too, so it's not as nice as, as Monty's. Uh, these are those anode tufts that we were, or spots that we were talking about. You can see how, uh, this one was actually taken at a thousand frames per second. So uh, you can see these things move around in a, in a correlated manner. Uh, very fast on uh, the surface of the anode. And in the very last few frames of this thing, um, uh, as, as you watch it go on, you will see uh, three tufts at the top and they start spinning there independently of all of the others. It, it's a really interesting phenomenon. And there really have only been um, two serious papers published on it, one in 1930 and one in 1940. And uh, it was first observed around 1909 or 1910, uh, but nobody's done any work on it since. So um, what you see, and in fact, this is a picture of Tuft taken uh, from the 1940 article um, on this. And what, um, what happens is that uh, you see our anode down in the bottom, and uh, the tuft, oh, I took the cap off. Uh, the, the tuft is actually floating on um, hydrogen that's been uh, uh, absorbed into the iron of, of the anode, and then as it heats up, comes back out again. So the, the tuft is not actually connected to the anode. There's this layer of, uh, of hydrogen underneath. And but then the, the tuft forms and there's a, a strong positive ion current going up and because the current's flowing that way, there are electric fields form and magnetic fields that, uh, that go around it um, so that uh, be, with all of those fields, the tufts tend to be equally spaced. Uh, so if one moves because it runs into a hot spot on the anode and it starts moving, then all of the others move and that's why they rotate and all that, but and and they form because um, we can we can see it as we change the pressure of the hydrogen. Um, at some point, uh, the current gets to be too large for the anode to uh, to deal with as just a sphere. So it forms these things. It basically gives a greater surface area and a uh, 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 more efficient means of absorbing the electron current that's coming into it. Uh, so th th there's a lot of uh, interesting things that can be uh, uh, looked at here considering it's been um, pushing 80 years since anyone looked into it. Now, uh, the issue of uh, mass equals three has come up. And this is a, uh, a graph I made um, from uh, a uh, uh, one of the mass uh, spectrometer things. And um, you can see our hydrogen. And uh, in this particular case, there was a bit of water vapor in it. Water vapor is hard to get rid of. And you basically have to pump way down, let it get hot, and then let gas in and pump it back up again. Um, and we get some atomic hydrogen because the H2 dissociates. So uh, what's this mass equals three? Now, um, it, uh, there are a number of possibilities. Um, you can do it with fusion reactions involving uh, 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 protons and deuterons, or deuterons and deuterons, a couple of different channels. Uh, or uh, the bottom reaction is just an ionic reaction that occurs uh, everywhere in the universe. And H3 plus is, in fact, the most common molecular ion in the universe. Um, and the natural abundances of deuterium and uh, uh, hydrogen-3 uh, are shown there, 150 parts per million, 1.4 parts per million, the, the natural abundances. And of course, there's no tritium. It has a half-life of 12 years, so it's gone. Um, so I, I've been thinking about this. I spent uh, 
a lot of last week um, uh, driving a thousand miles of the Race Across America uh, route uh, as an official for the bicycle race. And uh, so it gave me a lot of time to think about this. And um, the, my feeling is, uh, after looking at that, well, I did a quick calculation. Uh, the, uh, with, those, with the natural levels of, uh, uh, of deuterium um, in our experiment, uh, we would observe probably one fusion reaction every four trillion years. Um, but uh, uh, there probably are ways to uh, investigate this um, uh, further, and, and uh, we have a large parameter space to work within, so I, maybe the best we can do would be 10 reactions a second uh, if we uh, looked in the right part of the parameter space, and it would be a, um, it's something we could measure. I mean, it's not like it produces much energy, but it's something we could measure. So uh, that, that, that's something we might, might look into. Um, but uh, the, so my, my own opinion after thinking about this for a long time is that uh, the mass equals three is a spurious artifact uh, of the mass spectrometer that we use, the way it works. And um, in this particular case, I don't know if the manufacturer would agree with me. I think it's a bug and not a feature to use um, uh, use uh, software uh, lingo. So uh, uh, a lesson to be learned from that uh, is that uh, you really need to understand not only what you think you're measuring, but what your instrumentation and the analysis and models, and they're always analysis and models that you can't measure anything directly, uh, what you're actually measuring or observing. And if you, uh, um, if you don't abide by you know, that moral um, and uh, run off to uh, uh, the New York Times with a discovery, uh, it's what we call the Pons and Fleischmann effect, um, then uh, uh, you, might, you might be in serious trouble. So uh, when you're doing this kind of work, you always have to pay attention to, um, to this kind of thing, that uh, what you think you're measuring isn't necessarily what you're measuring and what you're observing isn't necessarily caused by what you think is causing it. So that's it. <laughs>